I've been hearing all week on social media that there's an attack on gardening. There is propaganda against gardening happening. Or is there? We're going to talk about it today. Hey, my nature loving friends, it's Bree here at Blossom and Branch Farm. It is another cold and dreary day. We are still thawing out. We're still thawing out from our big snowstorm last week. And while all of that was going on, a few of you wrote to me and said, Hey, have you seen this study that just came out? And so I read it. We're going to talk about it today. Is gardening under attack? So the messages that I got were about a study that came out in January that was published in a nature journal. And it was done, I believe, by the University of Michigan. And the headlines that have been coming out of the study is that home gardens have a six times higher carbon footprint than conventional farms growing produce. So one serving of food grown in a home garden is equivalent of six times the carbon footprint of a serving of food grown on a conventional farm. So what's happening is this headline is getting picked up and people are just reading the headline and they're automatically saying, this is propaganda. They are trying to get people to not garden at home. I'm not gonna sit here and get into politics and get into conspiracy theories. It's not what I do here on this channel. I talk about the science and our experiences. So I read the study and I want to share some takeaways that I got out of it and I'd love to start a discussion here about it. So first let's talk about the study itself. Basically what they look like were urban farms, so small farms in urban centers, community gardens and home gardens, and then they compared them to conventional mass producing farms. And then they looked at carbon footprint per serving of food, essentially. So at first glance, or if you just take this at headline value, then yes, it does sound like, how can this be? Obviously, everybody knows that growing produce at home is better for you. The food isn't traveling as many miles. I think there are many things that were ambiguous in this study. So some of the flaws that I found were that, for example, they talked about composting and how a home gardener compost can have a higher carbon footprint because they're often poorly managed. They become anaerobic. When they become anaerobic, they tend to release methane, which is a hotter greenhouse gas, and that can be bad. But I didn't see any reference in the study to the fact that they offset, for example, the methane that would be produced by a poorly managed compost pile at home compared to what would happen if those home gardeners were throwing their produce scraps into the landfill, what methane would be produced from that because either way you're getting methane. So there were some things that I didn't see really clearly discussed. Also one of the recommendations that were made I would call into question. But my overall vibe from this study was that actually it had a lot of truth and it was because the number one thing that led to these home gardens having a higher carbon footprint wasn't the food miles. It wasn't the fact that perishable foods are being shipped hundreds or thousands of miles to consumers. It was the fact that basically farms are growing in the soil and are using less inputs per square foot per serving of food. So when you look at a home garden and I'm not talking about every home garden here, but the gardens that have become popularized by a lot of big creators here on this platform and on other platforms are ones that create affiliate income. And what I'm saying by that is these gardens that rely solely on purchased raised beds, uh, a lot of different inputs. They rely on selling a lot of fertilizers. They rely on selling various things. Those channels have made us think that this is the way we should be gardening. That raised bed gardening in these purchased raised beds is the best way to do it. Uh, buying all these accessories for our beds, buying all these kits, buying all these whatever it is. And you can see it. I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it on many different channels, um, but this push to buy a lot of infrastructure. And so the study actually found that the infrastructure was the biggest contributor to that home garden carbon footprint. So is there an attack on gardening? No, 
I really don't think that's the takeaway from the study. I don't think it's propaganda. I think what the study, and if you read the recommendations of the study, what the study is trying to say is that instead of buying in all this stuff to garden, the best thing to do is to grow at home, but to buy in as little as possible, which is what we always talk about here. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Gardening should not be such a consumeristic endeavor. It shouldn't cost us $20 to grow one tomato. This is not how home gardening used to be. It did not used to be so expensive to do this. And that's because people used what they had. For most of us, the soil that we have here in the ground, obviously there are exceptions to this. For example, if you live on bedrock or if you have mobility issues and you need to grow in raised beds, then there are always exceptions to this. But for most of us, those with sandy soils, those with heavy clay soils, trust me, we have very heavy clay here in Colorado. We are able to work with it and grow in the ground just fine. For a long time, for hundreds of years, people grew in the ground. They survived on what they could grow in the ground. They didn't have to buy in fancy containers. It just was not a thing. And when we started to do that, when, when consumerism and marketing took over the garden space, that is when we started to see it becoming so much more expensive to garden. And it became this joke where everyone was like, ha ha, I only had to spend $100 to grow this one tomato. It shouldn't be that way. You can start seeds in a wooden tray made out of scrap wood that you found on Craigslist or even in the alley, okay? And if you're concerned about treated lumber, actually there are now studies out that show that we don't need to be concerned about treated lumber leaching things into the soil. So don't even really worry about that. You can use recycled yogurt containers. You can use all kinds of different things to start your seeds in. If you need to create a raised bed, you can use scrap lumber. Treat it with a shosugi bond that we showed the other day, charring the wood, sealing it so that it's water resistant. You can use rocks to build raised beds. You can use twigs and do a wattle fencing to build a raised bed. There are so many different options that do require a little bit more effort maybe and a little bit more creativity, but really at the end of the day, gardening should not be taking more away from the earth than it is giving back, is my belief. If you don't agree with me, that's fine, but this is my channel, so I get to say what I want. Anyway, that rant, that was a rant. That was a nice rant. <laughs> that was the number one thing that the study found has an impact. So ways to offset this, if you already have metal raised beds, that's fine. Just use them for as long as possible. They're saying decades. It takes 20, 30, 40 years to offset those beds. The carbon footprint of manufacture of that steel and shipping that steel takes a long time to offset. So if you have them already, use them for as long as you possibly can. Unfortunately, I have a few beds that are already starting to rust. They're only in their first season. They are pitting out around the bottom. So I am really, really bummed about that. The other thing that goes along with buying all those raised beds is buying in all that soil, shipping soil all over the place, and specifically shipping plastic bags of soil all over the country has a footprint, right? Those bags are heavy. They use a lot of plastic. So that to me was the biggest takeaway of the study is that it's not just about gardening itself. And by the way, this wasn't true of all produce. So they looked at different produce. So for example, they looked at tomatoes. They found that tomatoes actually did have a lower carbon footprint when grown in the home garden versus grown on a conventional farm because often conventionally tomatoes are grown in hothouses, in greenhouses that have a lot of lighting and heating. That's how we get tomatoes in wintertime. Um, and those come with a high footprint. So it's not true across the board. And they did call that out in the study as well. It's dependent on the produce that we're looking at. Now, they also did actually say that urban farms was a little bit different. I'm not sure, this was a flaw, I think, in the study. They kind of lumped urban farms in with home gardens. And I think that a lot of urban farms grow, you know, similar to conventional farms where they're just growing in the soil like we do with mounded beds, but not in raised bed structures. So not requiring as much infrastructure. But the one thing that urban farms scores badly on is the use of plastic. So the use of that landscape mulch, the landscape plastic that sits on top of the soil and is used as a mulch. We used it in the past. I will never use it again. And we've removed all of it because of the microplastic contamination with the soil and just because of the resources that it takes to make that plastic. So what the recommendation is for home gardens and for urban farms is that if you have infrastructure like sheds, beds, cell trays, plastic containers, 
watering cans, irrigation, mulch, plastic mulches that you make them last for as long as possible. So just really use them um, until the very end of life, until they cannot be used anymore. Don't just change them out with the next trend or whatever it is. And I do agree with that with the exception of landscape fabric because the older landscape fabric gets, it leaches more and more microplastics, which is why I think it's best to just not use it at all from the get-go. The other recommendations that were made were that farms should try to use waste from the community as much as possible, or gardens can also do this. So community gardens using scrap lumber again to build things like fencing and pathways and beds. And this is where I kind of disagreed with the study a little bit was one of the recommendations was using waste output. And I think what they meant by that was municipal sludge or biosolids. And we have a video about this called PFAS in the Garden, Should We Be Concerned, where we talk about the fact that these composts that are made with biosludge or waste output from municipalities, human poop, uh, they contain things like PFAS or forever chemicals that stay in the soil forever. You can look up what happened in Maine and why they banned using human waste up there because of all the different contaminants that are in human waste. So I don't agree with the study on that one. I don't think that's a good recommendation. That's not going to help our soil health. That's not going to help the plastic load in the soil or the chemical load in the soil. So on that recommendation, I did not agree. And the other recommendation was that, uh, was that farms and community gardens should use their spaces as, you know, a community gathering space, an educational space. And I do think that that's a great thing that we could all do. And I know a lot of farms already do do that, but those are some of the recommendations that were given as a way to offset the carbon footprint. Of course, that doesn't really work for a home garden because I don't think most home gardeners are going to start inviting a bunch of people and strangers over to their house. I don't think, maybe you will, I wouldn't. But maybe some of you want to start using your garden as a gathering space and a place to share community-minded ideals. I wasn't really planning on having a rant like this today, but it kind of took off that way. And, at the, and I guess the, the end takeaway is that this is not propaganda, okay? It's not a conspiracy that the government doesn't want people gardening. No, that's not it. It is actually just that the way we've been marketed to for the last 10 years-ish, has been buy all of this stuff, buy this bed, buy this container, buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that, buy this, and it does add up. And if you think that your garden does not contribute, that buying all this stuff is going to be offset by the food miles that you save, by the food you're producing, unfortunately, the studies show that that is probably not the case. So the best thing to do is to, if you have a raised bed already, if you have stuff you've purchased, make it last as long as you can reuse what you can, and whenever possible, just grow in the dirt. We've got snow on the ground right now, but when it melts, we're gonna be showing you some different ways to build some garden beds. And if you haven't seen it, you can reference back to our three ways to build a garden bed. I'll link it at the end of this video. They don't require the purchase of raised beds and see which way is right for you. All right guys, that's it here for me today. If you have any questions or things to contribute, please feel free to put them down below. I always like to have a good conversation and we'll see you guys around here soon.